Um, so I'm, today I'm going to talk about actor model and basically our journey in you know how we you know build a systems based on actor model, deployed it to production, and like what we learned, what came out of it, what problems did we face. So let me start with a you know like short game with the auditorium, right? Who have heard about actor model? Okay, who have used actor model in sort of play projects or I don't know some you know one-off things? Um, who have built production systems on it? Okay, did you notice that I haven't raised my hand when I was talking about play projects? That's exactly it. We're just you know on the like as we say in Russian on a blue eye, we just built something on the technology that we never worked with, deployed to production, and it sort of worked. Um, so just a quick intro, like more detailed introduction. So this is myself about 10 years ago. Um, 11 years of software engineering, it used to be full stack before it was, um, you know, made single page applications before it was mainstream. Uh, turned backend uh, with Redmart for like about three years and, you know, built Scala, functional programming, uh, response time sensible applications and sort of high load ready applications. Uh, this is where to find me. So uh, what's the problem that we're solving? So this screenshot basically shows the like uh, delivery grid. Well, I basically just adapted it a little bit from our, you know, this is actually a current screenshot from Lazada applications and web browser. Like, technically, it's a little bit wider because it only shows three days, but actually we're showing it for seven days. And it's basically, uh, like how many of you actually order something on Redmart or Lazada? Okay, so to those who haven't, we're basically uh, given, giving two hour slots for deliveries. And in our model, we just basically, th that's our promise to customer and this is very bad to violate it. So we do everything we can uh, from, so that from the technology perspective, we're not violating this, this promise. And that basically means that we need a very strong like not a strong, strong, but still very strong consistency model to sort of support it. So um, in particular, like we sort of decompose the problem so that we need like linearizable problem, uh, serialization level model, um, which is basically like on the right, there it's um, sort of single object consistency models. On the, on the left, it's more like consistency models that touch multiple objects. So in our case, we just basically needed the strongest consistency model except like strong strict serializable uh, that talks about single object. And we basically used a lot of ACA and ACTRA model and technologies and features to achieve that. So, um, you know, taking a step back, what is ACTRA model? That's basically like a model of computation. So, um, you know, theoretical, uh, groundwork for actor model was made in early 1970s or like uh, late 1970s, early 1990s um, in small, small talk language. So um, there is a sort of like a, uh, anecdote that Alan Kay, uh, who is considered the author, the, the, the father of object-oriented programming term, actually meant something that's really closer to actor model than to object oriented because in his definition objects everything is an object objects interchange messages objects run concurrently and so on that's quite close to what actor model actually does there is other like on the internet there is other argument that it basically like this was a definition of small talk before small talk 80 and in small talk 80 is actually object oriented but before it was actor model but anyway, um, so actors run concurrently. Uh, actors exchange messages. Uh, messages is basically the only method of communicating with actor. You're not supposed to hold a reference onto actor. You're not supposed to send the actor like over the internet. You're not supposed to serialize it. It's just basically it. Uh, only send messages. Actors encapsulate internal state. Anyway, the only way to access like internal state somehow is to send the message to an actor and wait for response if necessary. Um, while it's not uh, strictly uh, enforced in ACA and in most of other actor model implementations, 
the best practice is to only return read-only views of the internal state if necessary. Yeah, and like one actor is a pretty boring actor system and they usually come with, with hierarchies. Yeah, and in hierarchies is basically like one of the mechanisms to uh, improve reliability by compartmentalizing, handling, and recovering from the errors. So in Scala, um, actor model implementation is provided by ACA. And you know, just a few words about uh, Scala, if you don't know what's that. Uh, that's a basically a multi-paradigm language running on GVM. It supports object-oriented programming, it supports functional programming, it supports actor model, and even if you mix all together, it doesn't you know, make your eyes bleed. So here's basically an example, like a very short one, that has examples of all the three sort of paradigms or programming styles. Um, so in Akka, <coughs> there are sort of like, with latest version, I guess 2.5 if I'm not mistaken, they finally released the typed actor, um, I don't know, infrastructure, which were in sort of beta state for quite a long time. Um, yeah, but I guess I'll start with simple ones and just you know, uh, illustrate by the differences. So simple actors basically receive and send messages. Uh, handling every message is sort of concurrent free, so actor does not pull any messages from its mailbox until current message is processed. Um, actors can swipe the receive method, which is basically the entry point for messages. And there are multiple applications to that. The more known ones are, you know, modeling uh, finite state machines, or you know, basically changing actor behavior. Well, yeah, the, the other one, the, the other notable example of usage is that you can model a mutable state using in immutable data structures. And the only mutable part of, of, of basically your, your actor is the changing context, uh, changing receive function. So one of the caveats is that for simple actors, receive is a partial function, which means that it doesn't, info it, it actually uh, takes any as an input and it's a partial function. So there is no guarantee that the message that you send to an actor will be in any way processed. In fact, that's sort of like a common caveat that when you send a message and expect a response or an action, but that message is either totally unknown to an actor or it cannot process it in its current state, as in there is no case in this partial function that you are using currently, nothing will happen. So if you wait for response, you will not get it. Uh, if you, you know, expect some action to happen, nothing will happen. Right? So that's sort of a common caveat, and one of the reasons for you know, coming up with the, this archetyped uh, infrastructure slash different world. Um, that sort of tries to address two things. One is this receive being partial function, and second, improves um, type safety. Right, so archetyped is basically like you need to actually define what is the type of messages that, that this actor can handle. And your receive functions become a total function that you know uh, takes that like I don't know interface uh, trait as an input and produces some output. So the big difference is that um, in simple actors there is a sender helper method that you can use to sort of respond to to uh, the actor that sent you this message. In ACA type they made a decision to remove that um, to sort of explicit and to explicitly include it in the message so that type safety can be observed. And that took much longer than I expected. Um, so yeah, uh, on top of you know, basic actors, in ACA there are multiple more sophisticated features, like uh, a few notable ones are ACA streams, which is basically like an implementation of reactive streams on top of actors. You know, gives you back pressure within your service. Uh, ACA HTTP is basically like a, like a library that gives you ability to handle HTTP requests. Again, this provides back pressure between the services. Um, ACA persistence gives you event sourcing, and one of the most powerful, but also most, um, how do you say that, uh, complex to handle, 
uh, is Akka cluster with various plugins such as singleton, sharding, distributed data, and so on. So cluster gives you an, an ability to build application level clustering. And paired with like a classic mix is cluster, sharding, and persistence sort of gives you a, a cluster of persistent entities that are transparently rebalanced between your nodes, scales almost horizontally, persist messages, and then sourcing, and so on. So this sort of puts us closer to what we actually need. So that's basically like a high-level overview of uh, our solution. Uh, basically, we have like a gateway service that you know, uh, serves as an entry point to all of the rest. Uh, capacity service being an orchestrator. So I'm not showing full details here, but there are other other services that capacity interacts. Um, one notable uh, service is this capacity cache all service, also known as God of Cache, which is basically caches every bit of infrequently changed data from other services such as restrictions and parking locations, stuff like that. And there is capa transport capacity service, which is actually like a stateful service that gives us all the consistency guarantees. And then we have uh, Cassandra and Redshift. Uh, Cassandra as a main data store and Redshift as a data store for analytical queries. So if we zoom into transport capacity service, which is, I guess, the most interesting there, is like we have gRPC interface as an entry point. Then I sort of sliced it into three use cases uh, or three requests. We have um, get availability requests, which is basically like a read request uh, asking for like at what slots do we have do, do we still have capacity so that we can sell, show them to the customers. So that grid on on this slide, right, is basically served from the response of get availability. And then when customer performs uh, checkout, we receive reserve, and that goes through actor sharding mechanisms over the network, falls into like one particular shift actor, and you know causes state updates. Right. So um, cancel basically the same, except like we initially tried to use other uh, Akka cluster plugin called distributed data. So that plugin gives uh, like a collection of replicated conflict-free data types, like CRDTs. Uh, but in our observation, we sort of basically figured out that distributed data works pretty poor. And it doesn't hold uh, the request rates that we're anticipating. And surprisingly, broad, just you know, mindless broadcasting to all the actors work much better. Um, okay, so uh, I guess I've removed one important slide. <laughs> um, so we structured this whole thing so that, like uh, Redmart's model of operation, is that we have shifts that perform deliveries, right? And in each shift, we have like few drivers and few vans. And the most important part is that those vans and drivers are not shared, uh, shared between the shifts. So in this case, shift actor basically represents this one last mile shift. So all the capacity that we have for delivery is basically you know, nicely encapsulated in a shift. And uh, by representing it as a shift actor, we for free uh, got the guarantees that ACA provide, which is this one. Um, so because of actor like Akka's guarantee that no messages are processed concurrently. We just basically have sort of a single threaded uh, apart like compartment for executing and handling every message. Uh, it also encapsulates internal state so that like actually there is no way to access that state outside, no way to mutate it, and no way to have race conditions. So on top of that, uh, since our shift actors are sharded, uh, Akka makes sure that there is exactly, well, sorry, not exactly, at most one instance uh, of sharded actor running somewhere in the cluster and handles 
uh, rebalancing, uh, recovery from crashes and stuff uh, transparently to us. So and that basically like these two together gives us uh, two things. One is completely concurrent free execution model. And the second one is that we always have one rider for a single last mile shift. And um, because failures and node crashes and network splits are handled transparently by, by ACA, there's no single point of failure in the system. So that uh, we can, you know, add or remove nodes to our running cluster at any time, and all the loads is nicely rebalancing between them. So what do we have learned? Um, serialization protocol is very important. So initially we chose cryo, and that was actually a very poor choice. So um, the thing is, this serialization happens not only for messages that are sent between the nodes in, in, the, in the cluster, but also um, all the events uh, persisted by your persistent doctors are serialized as well. And cryo basically doesn't have any support for backward and forward compatibility. So uh, yeah, and in, in terms of event sourcing, uh, like a canonical implementation is that every event should be maintained for like eternity and the application should be able to process it and, and so on. And with cryo, it was basically quite challenging to perform schema migrations on the events. So like basically the lesson learned is that uh, binary protocol is more efficient, but you really need to keep tr like uh, plan for sch uh, schema evolution and choose a mechanism that support forward and backward compatibility. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, distributed data let us down. So not all the uh, ACA plugins are equivalent, like uh, equally good. Uh, sharding is awesome, except it has quirks. So. It's just basically, as soon as you are doing any ACA persistence, you need to have ACA sharding, and then you need to figure out how to solve brain split problems. And Lightband has a paid plugin for that, or you can roll on your, your own implementation. Um, and sort of one last thing is that uh, best practice that we figured is to separate actor like messages handling, persistence, recovery, and blah, 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 from actual uh, entity behavior. Because it was quite challenging. Like initially, we sort of have had everything um, as an actor state, like, a, like very plain variables, like maps and, and integers and stuff like that. And it was quite challenging to test the business logic in isolation from the actor. So when we sort of like artificially introduced an, an entity, and separated handling messages from updating, like doing the business logic, uh, it became much better. Yes. So as a result, we do have the consistency model that we needed. Each service runs in highly available mode so that we can you know, restart them at will. Uh, our production fleet is basically 11 T2 micro instances, and it sort of handles 660 requests a second, uh, under 100 milliseconds. And that's basically it. OK. Um, we have another game to play. So there are some swag from our lovely HR department. So they asked me to sort of play this game. Um, the one who asks the best question gets the best swag we have. Other guy, like other questions, will be also be rewarded. Rewarded. Come on. Who wants a tumbler? <laughs> uh, do you want to speak through microphone, maybe? Yeah. So my question is, 
Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's that's basically one of the topics I've um, intentionally omitted for to sort of shorten my presentation. Uh, but basically, Lightband, some documentation on ACA has a list of four strategies that you can employ. Uh, like the simplest one is basically a static quorum. You know that you will be running X number of instances, and you just basically make sure that the, the nodes that observe less than half of it terminate. Right, so that's exactly what we did. Because we, we, we actually knew that we will be running three, and this was sort of like, let's just go with the simplest one. And it sort of worked well because we don't need to auto scale. Right? The more sophisticated ones include dynamic majority, which is basically like it recalculates how many members it has, but that one is sort of more dangerous because like membership changes might not be propagated in time. So if your cluster accidentally grows and then shrinks dramatically in short amount of time, uh, like and, and then splits, these two um, you know, regions of your former cluster might not detect the same number of you know, what was the, the largest number. So that's sort of more riskier. Uh, the other one is um, oldest first or something like, but basically like the part of the cluster that has the oldest node in it is kept, the, everyone else is just terminating. And the third one is, or oh, the fourth one, you basically designate a particular like arbiter based something. You just basically designate a node. The, all the nodes that doesn't see that arbiter node terminate. And that's basically it. But in our case, uh, static quorum was totally enough and we built our own implementation. It's really like probably one additional actor with like 50 lines of code or something. Was not too, too hard to build, was much harder to test. Okay, anyone else? On that note, how do you test this? Uh, test what? The system. Uh, Anything. Anything. So we have a, like a collection of unit tests, right? So let, let's go by like you know uh, bottom up. At the lowest level, we have our business entity. So that business entity doesn't have like any dependencies on anything. So we just unit test it in in obvious ways. It, it's almost um, side effect free. It just logs. So it, it's almost like functional programming, almost. Um, then on actors, uh, ACA provides ACA, ACA test kit. So that gives you ability to send messages and assert expect messages and stuff like that. Uh, on top of that, there's basically like a set of integration tests. Um, I'm not 100% sure if we do the tests at the HTTP level, mm. but you know, at least in some sort, like not, not necessarily in transport capacity service, which is like the, the bottom, but for capacity service, I definitely do have sort of tests that test the entire thing. And then we obviously have end-to-end -end tests uh, that are maintained by our QA. But like the basic, or like the, if, I, if you allow me to rephrase the question, how do you test actors, right? Yeah. So plain actors, there is a test kit that basically runs your actor system. It gives you ability to spin up actors, monitor them for termination, send messages, expect messages in return, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the most powerful is probably a sort of called autopilot. You create an actor and configure it what to respond, and then it just you know engages in, res in communication with the other ones. Um, so other things, like the more advanced features of ACA, right? So streams, there is stream test kit, right? Uh, in, in the, you know, degraded uh, case, you can just, you know, create a stream, send one mess one item into it, and assert on what comes out, like, from, from the other side. You know, pretty standard, uh, you know, like, specs to Scala test, whatever can do that. Cluster, I guess, is more, most hilarious, because there is a multi-JVM SBT plugin that allows you within the single test 
uh, spin up multiple GVMs, running multiple ACA, class, um, ACA systems, joining them together into a single cluster, then sort of putting um, synchronization points, like all the systems need to reach this state in order for tests to proceed and then send messages on the server net. Uh, we did have a few multi-JVM tests. It was pain, right? It, it, it runs slowly, it starts for like two minutes. It's very hard to maintain. So we just basically use them to test this uh, self-implemented uh, uh, brain split protection strategy. Mm -hmm. And that's it. And then we removed it. Thank you. Thank you for, for asking. Hey, Damien. Oh, uh, well, dependency injection with actors is sort of interesting. So in order to create an actor, you need to create so-called actor props, which is sort of like a recipe for the actor system to create your actor. It is supposed to sort of encapsulate everything it needs to have. So... Um, well, there are basically two things to dependency injection. One is how to create your actor, and the, uh, the other one is how to inject your actor into uh, you know, other actors that you need to use it or other services or whatever uh, components. So we, to create an actor, you just use your normal injection. Uh, well, let's say it like this. You use a dependency injection container that has a support to use functions as factories. Right, and your factory is basically your actor dot props, whatever. So for play, there is support. In Juice, there is support. In Macquire, there is support for that, and so on. For injecting actors into uh, other components, you're not supposed to do that. You are supposed to inject actor references. Right, and for that, you first create an actor, obtain an actor reference, and then inject it normally. Again. Play has support, Macquire has support if you know how to do that. Uh, well, basically everything. You guys are using the, the account with Play or uh, We're using Macquire. Yeah. Okay. Which is a stat sort of compile time injection library for, for, for Scala. Is that complexity necessary for uh, you wouldn't believe how many times I've tried to convince uh, our business users and management that this level of consistency is not required and eventual consistency would work. Uh, I failed. So, and that basically means that we needed that level of consistency and that collection of technologies was you know, more or less straightforward way to achieve that. Okay, I guess, should we wrap up? Looking back, would you do it anything different? Uh, I would not use distributed data <laughs> in the first place. And, well, yeah, uh, I see. So, in, uh, in capacity service, which is an orchestrator, we used ACA streams uh, as sort of like an integration, like a wiring together, wiring all things together thing. I would probably not use it this, this time, but, I guess we're currently developing a system that would be using ACA streams, and I'm pretty confident that's the right way to do that this time. Okay. Do you use any message broker like Kafka or um, Do you also get an application? So between nodes in the cluster, ACA has mechanism to sort of transparently send messages. So it's like from the perspective of actor sending a message to another actor running on the other node, Nothing changes. It still uses the same actor ref, but then ACA transparently serializes it and, and sends it over. So in terms of using Kafka, RabbitMQ, whatever message broker, there are uh, adapters right, that can consume messages or send messages to and from Kafka, RabbitMQ, blah, 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 and convert it to actor messages and send it somewhere. Right? But like in, in our case, we didn't need to use that. There was a question. So do you find that it's uh, easy to, or how, how, 
Uh, yeah, maybe microphone. There's a, like a loud aircon. So do you have problem in uh, architecting the design of the whole vector system and uh, how the message flows and then how to maintain it mm -hmm. and how to scale it? Even to kind of like explain to another coworker to say this is how people design this. Mm -hmm. now, it is so flexible, it's so chaotic, so to speak. How do you manage it? Um, I guess honest question would be that uh, this whole thing was built by two senior software engineers, right? So there wasn't a lot of communication that required, and you know we basically understood what what happens. Uh, when we tried, when we started onboarding more junior folks, there was some learning curve for sure. Um, I guess in our case, um, what saved us was that, like we. Like on raw actors without any streams or blah, 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 there is just like one actor, like one type of actors that are sharded. And then there are no hierarchy, right? It's just, you know, they're, they're sharded, they're supervised by ACA and built ins and blah, blah, blah. So, um, like, a message exchange is more or less straightforward. You just only have one actor, then we sort of have a convention that you put all the messages in, in ACA companion object. You put all the events in uh, actor companion object. You put a sealed trait on them so that like messages are, are there, events are there. This is the structure of, of your code and so on. So with all that convention, it made really easy to follow the flows within one actor and like its immediate surroundings. And we didn't have a problem of you know having like enormous uh, actor system that have multiple types of actors that interchange chaotically. Um, well, theoretically, what I would do in, in this case, um, there needs to be like a really good collection of diagrams that describe like what, what kind of exchanges happen during processing of, of, you know, of, of a request. That's, yeah, that's probably not a really good answer to your question, but that's the best I have. <laughs> I think ACA type might actually help on, on that front a little bit, right? Because in this case, like, you have like a pretty well-defined interface of messages, and also you need to explicitly send, uh, like, basically where to respond to that. And then you can use like normal navigate to uh, support an IntelliJ or Eclipse or whatever. One of the things that we find is actually very good to use like because Everything is so dynamic. You can never reproduce the same thing as the same person. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not predictable. You cannot predict it because everything is, uh, messages is sent during one time. Mm -hmm. And each scenario you see is really different. Uh, the way of all the transition is completely different. Of course, the message is being consumed mm -hmm. in a serialized fashion. But the, the, the time that little messages are being well, I think you are at the scale where even like classically built solution would be hard to navigate as well. So, yeah, it's not a silver bullet. Complexity at the heart of complexity is not unavoidable. Okay, thank you guys. Uh, I guess we have two winners. Um, this gentleman, uh, and well, I'm hesitating. Do you want a cup? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, okay, and uh, the uh, gentleman at the back. Okay, so thank you guys for asking good questions. Okay, thanks. Uh, I don't know how like uh, other swag is supposed to give in, but I'll ask Hui in return and everyone who asks question will have something. So thank you guys.